A while ago, you may remember me doing a video about these, the Burroughs Portable Adding Machine and the Comptometer. These are two mechanical calculators that I am a huge fan of, but there's a third calculator similar to these that I've been trying to get my hands on for a while, and I finally have. So I'm excited to show today the Monroe adding machine, which is uh, quite a bit larger than the other two, and also not that exciting, but is actually one of the easiest mechanical calculators I have ever used, and was the only one that really had any success being electrified. So since today I needed to record another quick video while working on bigger projects, we're going to take a tour through the Monroe adding machine and see what it's like compared to its two main rivals. First though, a little background on the Monroe calculator because uh, its origins are a little different than the other two calculators. Both the Burroughs and the Comptometer adding machines started out in the 1880s when the Industrial Revolution was starting to crank out some really interesting and complicated machines. But the Monroe wasn't part of this mechanical revolution and actually didn't come out until well after the turn of the century. It wasn't until J. Monroe first saw the Baldwin calculator design and realized that it hadn't been put into production. So he decided to found an adding machine company in 1912 and try to produce one and was finally able to deliver his first in 1914, which means that the Monroe came out almost three decades after the other two adding machines did. Now, despite the massive gap from when they were introduced, the three examples I have here, I think were all made within about a decade of each other. So this isn't a bad comparison between them. The Comptometer is from the 1920s for sure, based on the patents. The Monroe is a Model K-16-3, which has more significance that we'll get into, but probably dates it as a second generation calculator that would put it within the 1920s as well. And if I remember right, the Burroughs is probably in the mid 30s, so they are fairly close. Now, all three of these calculators have a crank on them, but every single one of them does something different with it. On the Burroughs, you pull the crank to both print to the display and advance the paper while adding to the register. On the Comptometer, the crank is only used to clear data and isn't actually used for input at all. On the Monroe, the crank spins freely, which has other implications that are kind of interesting and make it much easier to use. The other cool thing about the crank on the Monroe is that it spins both ways. So let's actually get into how the Monroe works here because it is fascinating. Now let's get into actually using these. I wanna start off by comparing the Monroe to the Burroughs and we'll get to the Comptometer later. And I wanna do this because it's pretty obvious that the Monroe is copying the style of the Burroughs. And they weren't the only one to do this. Uh, the Pike adding machine also copied the Burroughs before Burroughs bought them. So it was just kind of a thing where everyone copied the Burroughs because that's what a calculator looked like. It's kind of like how people copy Apple nowadays. But this was the turn of the century and uh, a little different. So design styles were not really all that flexible. Now, before we get into these, uh, I should mention that the Monroe is pretty dirty here. I've cleaned it up a little bit. It's mostly fully operational. Uh, there's just one minor thing where sometimes it will stick on the crank, but uh, other than that, it's perfectly fine. I will probably clean it up in a stream at some point because I don't have the time today to get it clean, but it does work. So there's no reason that we can't continue on. Now, when you first sit down to try and use one of these calculators, you need to make sure that you know what state it's in, and that means you need to reset it. So let's first reset the burrows, and you do this by hitting the total button here, which will print the total and clear the register, and it will do that by lifting all of the hammers up and striking them to the receipt. And now we know we are at a zero state in the register. On the Monroe, we can actually see the registers, which is really nice. Um, and there are a bunch of them there. Uh, we'll get into that more as we compare this to the Comptometer, which also has a visible register. But on this, we don't actually use the crank here to clear it. We use the other crank that's back here. <laughs> so it, it has multiple cranks, which is kind of fun. But uh, to clear the main register, we will actually spin it towards us, which will lift it 
roll all the digits and drop it down. But these top registers are cleared by spinning the same crank the other direction, which is kind of cool. Now there's another control here, um, and that has to do more with the difference between these two registers. But uh, if I just spin this one really quick, you'll see it advanced that register and it also advanced that one. And if we clear out right now, we cleared them both. And if we do this one more time and flip this over here, we'll see we only clear this one, which is handy in some cases uh, that we'll see in a moment. Now let's do some math. And I'll be honest, you'll probably not see <laughs> any results on the burrows because the ribbon is just really old and not doing so great. So just work with me and uh, pretend what it's doing. If we're gonna add 10 and two on the burrows, we'd add a one in the second column, pull the crank, it'll add 10, and then we'll add a two in the first column, pull the crank, and there we go. Now to see it, we can either do a sum total to show it without clearing the register, or we can do a complete total to print both, and it printed 12. Now on the Monroe here, uh, it will work fairly similarly. We'll do a one in the second column, but we have some other stuff to keep track of first here. So first off, the registers. Now this is a 16 digit register, which is part of the model number. The model number is K16 at the beginning, which means this is a 16 digit register. You could get this with varying widths of registers holding different amounts of data. Now you have these indicators that you can drag along to match the position on the keyboard where you are, and you actually have the ability to mark different sections down here with these little rollers, which is kind of interesting. All stuff that's missing on the burrows because it just prints to the paper. The more advanced burrows may have had those options, but this is the one that I have to compare to right now. The other thing about the Monroe is that the carriage moves. Now, this is crucial to how this thing works and is a indicator of what it actually is and why it really isn't that special. If I release these clips up here, we can see some of the inner workings. The inside of the Monroe works by spinning. And as I have the one in the second column there, you can see this gear ticks along nice and smoothly. This is because at its core, the Monroe is a pinwheel calculator. Now being a pinwheel calculator isn't a bad thing, it just means that it's based on a different principle than the other calculators here are. And this spinning carriage design was actually used in a lot of calculators going forward. The Monroe actually is kind of a foundation for most of these calculators, like a Frieden calculator. Uh, they all use this moving carriage register design because it's really easy to interface with. So despite being kind of simpler and a little more weird and mechanically complicated than both the Burroughs and the Comptometer, this design stood the test of time a little better. What's also kind of funny is that being part pinwheel in this calculator means that it's a little more similar to the Bond Context 10 over here that I reviewed a while ago, which is internally essentially a pinwheel calculator as well, although it has a 10 key keypad, which is very strange, and uh, that calculator is from the 50s, which is a whole other thing. You can watch the video I did about it here. Now let's finally add our 10 and two. And as you now understand that the registers move, you can understand that it's important to make sure that the digits up top are correctly in line with the number that you want to add to. So that's why you will want to use the indicators there and probably match them with the custom ones that you set down here. You can try and rely on the separated column colors down here, but you don't get that up top. So really you do need to use the indicators in the different places that are available. So we'll just make sure that the indicator is lined up with our white mark and we will go ahead and add. And that's pretty much it. Now we can just switch to this column and unlike the other two calculators, we actually have a zero for each individual column as well as a global zero. But we'll go ahead and use that one there, add it one more time. And that's it, we have 12 printed handily in the register. Now you may have noticed that this one advanced as well as this one. These are cycle counter registers and they can be used for more advanced computations, which let's go ahead and get into now by comparing this to the comptometer. 
I forgot before we bring in the comptometer, I still need to show you subtraction. And subtraction on the Monroe is actually even easier than subtraction on the Burroughs, which has the dedicated minus key here. So let me go ahead and walk you through that. So if we put 12 into the register again on the Burroughs and we want to subtract out, say four, we would hit four minus and then run the operation. And now our total would be eight. That's pretty easy. On the Monroe though, it's still even easier. We can put our 12 back into the register here. And then to subtract four, we'll just clear it out, hit four, and then just rotate. Now, this is the one problem this thing has. Uh, sometimes this catches, and I think it's something to do with overflow protection, but we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, for now, I can just kind of wiggle it a bit and then it'll get through. But anyway, to complete the subtraction, I just roll it backwards and there we are. So adding or subtracting is done on the Monroe by just turning the crank one way or another, which is very, very easy to wrap your head around and is why this is a lot easier to learn than say the comptometer. Now, when it comes to subtraction on the comptometer, I actually had to do a whole section of the video talking about these separate small digits on here, which are the nines complement of the main numbers and are how you do subtraction. And if you really want to learn more about how to do that, I highly recommend you go watch that video. For now, I'm gonna try and fumble through here again blind after not having watched that one in a long time uh, to try and demonstrate this. So if we put 12 in here, what we will need to do is subtract four from it, but we actually need to go up one because we have to subtract one from the number that we're trying to do. And this is where this gets a little messy. So we're actually going to hold the carryover because we can't use the carryover or it'll mess up the equation. And we're going to subtract our number minus one here. And now we need to disregard the last column because that's how this ends up working. But there we have our answer eight. And doing repeated operations like that are possible, but are complicated and you have to keep in mind multiple things. Because if you want to do uh, a larger subtraction, like let's say we have 45 in here and we want to subtract 12 from that, you actually don't have to uh, subtract the uh, one from the first digit. You have to do it from the last one and there we go, we have our answer 33. Nine's complement is very weird, but compared to over here, we can just input 45, add it, change over to 12, subtract it, and that's it. No trying to remember anything strange. We get our answer 33 right in the register, and it's incredibly simple. Now, once you've learned how to use the comptometer, it's a lot faster because your hand doesn't need to move over to the crank to perform different operations and clearing can be done very quickly and easily instead of, well, that's not too bad, but you would have to reach up to here to clear that. So that's part of what makes the comptometer special is that it's kind of a one hand device once you've really learned how to master it. And it actually wins in multiplication over here as well. Now, when it comes to multiplication, the Monroe is very easy to learn, but the comptometer is easy to learn and faster, and it just has to do with the key-driven mechanism that it uses. If we're gonna do 12 times 12, it's really hard to beat that and have your answer right there already. Now, the Monroe is not too bad. Because you can move the registers back and forth, you can leave 12 in the first section, rotate to add, then do it one more time so you actually get the correct answer, move the register over, do it once more, and have it there. Now. If you were experienced with this, you could go ahead and do this pretty quickly. And that's not bad, but it's still no, like the comptometer is. Division, on the other hand, is where the Monroe shines. And we're gonna go ahead and just drop the comptometer because while I can do nines complement division on it, and I have demonstrated that it's really worth focusing on the Monroe by itself because unlike any of the other mechanical calculators I have, division on this thing is dead simple and really well done. Now, before we get into division, I wanna take another look at these registers. These are the ones where I was talking about the switch over here being able to clear them independently, where that one will actually not be cleared and this one will because this one is the one that we're going to use for division. Now. In normal operations, addition and subtraction, you would use this register. 
And we're actually going to use this one as well. This one, I'm, I'm honestly not sure what you use it for other than tracking that you input your multiplicand correctly, um, which isn't useless, but it's not uh, necessary per se. But this register can be used to output results, even though this is the one typically done with that. And it has to do with how it works because this one is very different. You may notice that the zeros on here are squished down. They're a lot shorter than the other one. And that is because if we add here, we can see it goes up to one, but if we subtract, it'll go back to zero. And if we subtract again, this one goes to nine, but that one went to one. This counter has digits that are able to go forwards or backwards and show the number of cycles, unlike this one, which is basically another addition register. This is what is really powerful for division and is how this thing makes division completely effortless. Now being able to cycle count in both directions is really powerful. So let's start off by doing one of my favorite example calculations here and dividing 365 by seven. The answer should be 52.14 and so on. This is just the number of weeks in a year divided by how many days are in a week. So. We are going to start out by inputting our 365 here, and we already now have a one in that register, which we need to clear. And we can use the switch here to only clear that one if we really want, although it doesn't actually matter for us there because we're not gonna use this register at all. Now we're going to clear our input register down here, and we're going to go ahead and input our seven. This is where the subtraction comes into play, and we have a couple of options that we need to work on. So. The first thing is, is that when I was demonstrating the subtraction, I didn't really show this switch. Now, these are two switches that choose between single operations and repeating operations. And for division, you definitely want to have the repeating operation enabled. If we do that after a full cycle, it will clear the register, which really doesn't help us out here. So we won't want that. We're gonna want that in there. And let's go ahead and just subtract the seven back to 365 there. The other thing that is helpful is this switch. Now, this switch is actually useful in combination with the one up here. This one has a bell, and it's pretty easy to tell what it does. Um, it's gonna ring a bell, but when it rings the bell is related to this switch. This one is rather uselessly labeled one and two, and it actually took me a little bit of time to figure out what this does, um, and it's very useful. I just don't know why it's not labeled better. One means that it runs unchecked and the calculator isn't going to do anything. But two here, let's go ahead and actually clear our registers up here. Two means that if we have a number up here and then we try and subtract below that number, it's gonna lock. Uh, this is under or overflow protection. And it means that when you fill out the registers that it's going to lock the handle and prevent it from being able to do anything. We can now uh, go back, undo it, and reset our register to cross over the overflow boundary again. Now this is actually helpful for division because it allows you to work without really paying attention or thinking, which is a way of doing this a little bit quicker. So let's go ahead and add our 365 back in there, clear out our uh, display registers up there. Again, that one doesn't matter, so I'm not gonna bother preserving it. And let's start. Now, the primary way to do division is to subtract one number from another by moving the register. Now, if we had a smaller number that we were dividing than three, we would start here. But because we cannot divide three by seven without getting a remainder, we have to go ahead and move over. This is where we just start subtracting. And we're gonna run until it underflows. Now, it would underflow here and we could stop because this will actually be where we need to stop. But if we want to rely on the underflow protection, we can keep going and we're now locked. If I wasn't paying attention, I would be stuck here and I would know, oh, I need to flip this, go back one, which will change the cycle counter up here and fix the number we have in our main register. Then we can re-enable this and continue going. We're gonna flip the whole carriage over one more and continue our dividing. And there we go, 52.14 like I mentioned. 
So this is actually really handy and <laughs> kind of amazing. None of the other calculators do division quite as well as this. Even the Bond Context 10, which has a division feature built right in. That one is even more difficult than this. This is part of why I really like the Monroe. Even though it's not the most technically advanced calculator, it's the easiest to use for every operation all around. And it's kind of amazing in that way. Now, division's actually so easy on this thing. I want to add one more example to this this time because I wouldn't usually want to bother with this one on any of the other calculators because it doesn't really end and it's just kind of tedious to do division. And that is 22 divided by 7 as a rough equivalent of pi. And we're actually going to run out of accuracy in the third digit right here. So this is going to be a little bit of a fun one to show. So we're going to start out by adding 22 to our main register down here. We will clear our division register up here, and then we will switch over to the divisor there, and we can just start. I'm going to attempt to pay attention to the overflow protection instead of relying on the lever down here, but one thing that kind of sucks about the Monroe is that uh, once you've started an operation, you can't go back. It ratchets in, so you have to complete it no matter what it is, even if it's not what you wanted to do. So once you start an overflow, you have to grind through it and go back. So let's go ahead and begin as I calculate a rough pie. And there we go, 3.14. Two, and it should be one and five, nine, three, six, five, eight, nine, seven. Nine. That's uh, uh, just rough equivalent there. It's not meant to be super accurate, but you know, it's handy. And uh, it's fun to be able to do that so easily on here because it, it just works. None of the other ones hold your hand quite like this. It's really, really refreshing to see a mechanical calculator that is so easy to do division on. Well, I think that's pretty much all the controls on here to explain. Uh, this lever I've used a couple of times literally just lifts it up and allows you to slide the carriage around. Um, this lever doesn't do anything unless you hold it and then pull on the crank, because uh, you can remove this for reasons I don't know. Uh, it doesn't make sense, because if you push that all the way over, you still have that crank, and you can't as easily remove that one, so it's not like it's handy for storage. Maybe there was a way to quickly electrify it, but would you really need to have it be so easy to remove? So I'm not quite sure why it's like that, but it is. Um, and aside from that, there's really not a whole lot else to it. It's pretty simple and easy to use, which is really nice. It's actually kind of one of my favorites. If it, I don't know that I want to say it's my new favorite mechanical calculator, because honestly, comptometer. <sighs> Once you've mastered the comptometer, it's kind of awesome, <laughs> and it is a, a little bit of an elitist thing to be like, how do you do division on there, and then to do it, but honestly, I don't remember how to do division on it. I forgot, because it's really complicated, but this thing, super simple, and that does make it better, so the Monroe, definitely a nice addition to my calculator collection, and I'm super happy when I was able to pick it up. It's really cool, despite being kind of late to the party. Well, that's it for now. I wanted to keep this video a little simple. I hope you guys enjoyed checking out the Monroe calculator here. Uh, it's one that I am definitely going to keep using myself from time to time, just because it's kind of fun. I like having all my vintage calculators out and trying to use them in different ways, like the HP 41 CX that I was sent a while back now pretty much lives in my laptop bag because I want to have it handy all the time. But uh, this thing, definitely not even going to pretend to be portable like the Burroughs does. So uh, yeah, it's going to be staying here, but I'm definitely going to try and use it when I have the opportunity to. Well, if you guys enjoyed this video, you may want to subscribe. And if you want to help support the channel, you can find me on Patreon. But that is it for the moment, and I will see you next time.